guys. Welcome to the Hunter's Quest podcast. This is your host, Hunter McWaters, and I'm excited to be with you. If you're new, welcome. Thanks for listening. If you're a longtime listener, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for your support. Um, it's an exciting time. I am leaving tomorrow for Alaska, and I was able to squeeze in this podcast today, right before elk season, just in time, with Mr. Dirk Durham of Phelps Game Calls, the bugler himself. Um, you know, I got a lot going on, a lot of packing and family stuff, so it was tough to kind of squeeze this podcast in, but I wanted to talk to Dirk and lay down this podcast before elk season, so if you're heading out for your first elk hunt, or you're kind of new like me, or you know, even if you're experienced, uh, this is a great episode for you. We talk all about elk calling, um, different strategies. He you know, gives me some great examples of different types of bugles and cow calls and stuff like that, because I'm just learning uh, to elk call. Um, you know, I think I know just enough to be a little bit dangerous, but um, this was super helpful for me. He kind of broke down different types of calling and, and when to use them and stuff like that. So great episode with Dirk. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you guys have a great September, great hunting season, whether you're going out for elk or whatever it may be. I hope you guys are having fun, enjoying this time of year, and I hope this episode is helpful for you. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, I just recently announced, but I wanted to tell you guys here, I just became a ambassador for Mountain Ops. And so I know a lot of you guys use Mountain Ops products. I've been using Mountain Ops products for years. They were a big part of my weight loss journey. Now, again, of course, nothing can replace hard work, discipline, consistency, nutrition. Uh, if you're on a weight loss journey or just want to add muscle or whatever it may be. However, uh, supplements can and do help a lot. Um, I use their performance bars and Ignite and Slumber on pretty much every hunt. I used Blaze when I was in my kind of weight loss days to try to kind of curb some of those cravings midday. Um, they have a bunch of other great products too. Like they just come out with creatine and fish oil. I'm going to be using those and a hydration product as well. So um, they have great products. Um, they've got more great products coming out. Um, and I know a lot of you guys use them already. So I'm asking you, if you like what I'm doing, one way you can support, if you're already buying Mountain Ops products or if you just want to try them, go to Mountain Ops and use the code QUEST. You will save 20% and you will also be helping me out directly. So anytime you order, I know you guys have options as far as different people's discount codes to use. You know, I am just starting out. I'm start. I'm trying to get things going here. So I'd really appreciate it if you like supporting what I got going. Use that code Quest at Mountain Ops for anything you order, and every time you do, you will be directly helping me out, and you'll be helping yourself out by getting good products at a discounted rate. You save twenty percent, and you'll help me out. On top of that, just go ahead, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, look for the show on Sportsman Channel, which airs Mondays at 11.30 Eastern, that's 9.30 Mountain, or Saturdays at noon Eastern, which is 10 a.m. Mountain. Set your DVR to record the show. Um, I'm working really hard to keep uh, the podcast rolling out every week on top of that show, so subscribe to my YouTube channel, please. Uh, hit me up on Instagram, follow along at The Hunter's Quest, and leave me a rating and review on the podcast when you can. I know we got a lot of asks here right now, guys, but um, you know, it, it, I'm working hard. I'm trying my best to get established here, and I need your help to do so. So the biggest ways you can help me are subscribe to the YouTube channel, leave me a rating and review on the podcast, and if you want to get some Mountain Ops products before the season starts, Use that code QUEST and you'll save and you'll be helping me out. Um, so thanks again for your all support. I really appreciate everything. Again, have a great September. Have a great fall. I'll be back uh, shortly when you're listening to this from Alaska with plenty of updates. Hopefully, Lord willing, some caribou meat and antlers. And uh, I'll be updating you guys all about that. So thanks again and we'll see you on the next one. All right, guys, welcome to the Hunter's Quest podcast. I'm here today with the bugler himself, Mr. Derek Durham. How you doing, man? Doing great. How about you, buddy? Good, man. And we were just uh, talking before we got rolling about uh, we're just squeezing this in right in time before elk season. You got a lot going on, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to do some scouting this week. I've got to do, you know, believe it or not, you know, everybody thinks, oh, you, you work in the hunting industry. That must be <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 
you, you just go hunting all the time. Yeah. But uh, I got lots of work to do um, before I take off for a month. Um, yeah. You know, got chores around the house. And then I got a pack too. So I'm kind of a per- procrastinator. So I haven't packed a single thing, you know. So I'll, uh, I think I got almost two weeks to before season starts, but I got to, I got to squeeze a bunch of juice out of that two weeks oh, yeah. um, before I go. Yeah. I don't know about you, but like the, I, I kind of hate the last few days before a trip because so much stuff to do. You're trying to hang out with family, but your mind is like sort of already gone. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It, and, and especially for work. Um, back when I worked in nine to five, um, my boss always called me a lame duck, you know, the week before I'd leave for hunting. <laughs> He's like, man, I don't even know why you're here this week. <laughs> yeah. A lame duck. Like, I know, it's, man. It's weird, man. So, um, so just out of curiosity, um, what kind of like, when you say work, like what kind of day-to-day stuff are you working on? Um, you know, besides all the cool stuff, like just going out and killing elk. <laughs> um, well, we got another, uh, a call we're going to launch here at the end of the month. Oh, nice. Um, right on the 29th, I think, uh, some deer calls. So yeah. I got some of that got to come down to the pipe. So we got to do some cram, some last minute preps for that, um, uh, call, call launch. Um, I've got to record some podcasts of my own. So, um, I jumped on as a co-host for cutting the distance podcast with Jason Phelps. So yeah, I saw that. He does, we, we take turns. He, we do every other week, um, podcasts. Okay. So I got to make sure I have enough recorded, uh, for September and most of October, cause I'll be gone most yep. of October too. Um, so I got to get those all recorded up and in the can before, before I leave. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be tough too. Yeah. I know the feeling, man. That's, um, <laughs> that's always fun. Um, so you, I don't, so like I said, we, we, I think we have some mutual friends, um, but I never met you or spoken with you. So, um, just for me and, uh, you know, for people who might not know, could you just give me a little bit of background on kind of your story and how you got to where you are now? Yeah. Um, let's see. So I work for Phelps game call calls kind of. Um, I just, <laughs> just trans, I just, I've been transitioning into a new position. Um, so meteor is my real, my real employee now or employer now. So, um, but I do content creation for the Phelps game call side still I was okay. the marketing manager there for several years. And <clears throat> I've moved into a different position, more content creation, um, and for product support. Um, I take care of all the, the social media management side of Phelps. Okay. Um, and then podcast stuff new as well now. So, um, I still wear a lot of hats. It seems like I, they're like, Oh yeah, we're going to take some stuff off your plate. But <laughs> I think, I think I got more stuff on my plate than ever. Um, but it's good. It, it make, keeps me busy. Um, but, uh, I've been with Phelps since 2019, um, officially, um, as an employee, but, uh, before that Jason and I collaborated on, on elk calls, and I, we, I came out with this, uh, the Maverick diaphragm. Mm-hmm. So him and I worked on that to design that to my specifications. And so that, I think we started selling that one in 2018. Um, so him and I've been working together for quite a while. Okay. Um, can I push pause here for a second? Yeah. My cat's sure. freaking out. I got to put it outside. I don't know if that was a kid or a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking cat. <laughs> no worries, man. Yeah, yeah, no worries. All right, I'm back. No worries, um, that yeah, so take me. Cute. Oh yeah, dude. My uh, my cat used to make that exact same noise when uh, when he was young. Whenever we'd put him in like the laundry room at night, and now um, he's like he's actually like the coolest cat ever. So every morning I just let him out, and he just goes out and just probably like slays birds and mice all day. And then at <laughs> night I just open the door, and he runs back in, sleeps in the garage, and keeps the mice perfect. out of my house. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I love it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, going back a little bit. So you're from Idaho, correct? Yep. Yep. Born and raised here in Idaho. Um, grew up with elk hunting right out my back door. Um, I I didn't play sports in high school. I just went hunting all the time. So nice. I hunted almost every day of September. So once I filled my tag, I kept hunting with somebody else, you know, whether my best friend or my brother. And I'd hunt every <clears throat> every morning before school. 
Oh, nice. And every, every evening before school. So it was, it was awesome. I had like literally 10 minutes from my house. I could chase elk. Um, and before I had my, my driver's license, my mom would take me out and drop me off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she'd come pick me up at dark, you know, in the evening, or or sometimes she'd go along, like in the morning, she'd go along and wait. My my best friend, he had his driver's license first, so in the mornings, him and I would usually go together. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had they had um, drivers ed, and I'm like, okay, when's classes? And they're like, it's September. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not getting my driver's license till after <laughs> September. <laughs> That's awesome. So so you know. It, September and elk hunting was a big priority back then. Yeah. Um, That's, I have memories like that too, man. I remember, um, one time my parents were out of town for opening day of deer season. So my grandparents drove me in their minivan out to my hunting spot and dropped me off. And then I remember meeting my mom before school and like giving her a bunch of bloody clothes and my muzzle loader and then going to school with a dead deer in the back of my truck, but my dad didn't want me to bring my gun to school, so she would meet me and grab my stuff. So it's nice to have parents like that, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was awesome to have that kind of support. Yeah. Um, fast forward a few years, uh, and as going through high school, I, I would tell my mom, I'm like, school's ruining my life. <laughs> She's <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, I, I have to co- I have to come back from hunting every morning. I could I should just be hunting all day every day. And she just like, that's absurd, you know, and she'd laugh. She thought that's funny, pretty funny. <laughs> um, so then fast forward a few years, um, you got to join the workforce, right? So um, went to work for a, a tire company, uh, busting tires, working at a, uh, a tire shop. And I worked there 18 years. Uh, wow. I moved around and did management there for 10 of it. Um and you have to kind of to follow your career path. You have to move around. So I hmm. uh, moved over. Um, I think I had worked in six different stores in a couple different states and Idaho and Oregon. And um, finally was like, okay, I'm done with this. I got to do something different. And I got a job working at uh, Night Force Scope Optics there in oh, Orfino, nice. which is where I graduated from high school is in Orfino. Um, so then um i worked there for nine and a half years and got to the point it was like you know what it's time for to make a change again and and phelps and i had kind of always joked around he's like when are you going to quit your job and come work for me i'm like i don't know <laughs> finally i'm like hey were you serious about that because i'm ready and he's like all right let me let me figure this out and, and we, nice. fi- we we figured it out and made it work and uh yeah i've been here ever since were you guys just like kind of buddies from just both being in Idaho, elk hunting, just kind of being in the same circles or how'd you guys link up? So he's from Western Washington. Um, and he shot this, uh, big bull back in 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. And, uh, at the time, uh, another guy and I started an elk hunting magazine called extreme elk magazine. Okay. Um, and, Back then, instead of Facebook uh, being fun and cool to waste your time on, everybody got, get on hunting forums, right? And everybody's oh, yeah. always on hunting forums. And um, there was this Washington hunting forum, and Phelps was always on there, and he, he was posting a picture of his big bull. I'm like, hey, I got to have that story. So, um, oh, okay. I, and I think I'd met him at the Butte Elk Calling Contest, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation Elk Calling Contest before that. Yeah. So... I reached out and I'm like, Hey man, what do you think about, um, send us your story on your elk so we can put it in the magazine. He's like, Oh yeah, I can do that. Um, and then we connected a little, um, uh, better at some of the elk calling contests after that and kept track of each other and, um, got to be, you know, got to be social media buddies. And, yeah. and then, you know, anytime we'd see each other, it was, it was good. We come become friends. And then, um, he's like, Hey, what do you think about, um, working with me on some calls and let's do something cool. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I hadn't had that opportunity before. So, um, I jumped over and started working with him, built and designed that Maverick call and man, the rest has been history. It's been good. Yeah. So did he, cause you, you do compete or you've done competitive elk calling as well too, right? Yeah. 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 I used to do that a lot. Um, okay. Um, and so when you jumped over to work with him, was that like uh, you know big risk? Did you had to take a big pay cut, or um, 
were you able to kind of jump in and still make some make a little bit of a salary how that whole thing go down like when i first started uh collaborating with on calls with them yeah when you jumped over to start working okay with yeah um so um before that i'd never got a single dime from uh the company i was yeah. repping before um and i and i honestly i'd been there um using their calls since the inception of them you know and um i'd won multiple world championships and just there was no opportunity for any kind of you know any 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 cheese so yeah. it, it was it was it was a hard decision because, you know, you have friends, you know, and you, 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 you don't want to like, feel like you're abusing your friendship, but you know, sometimes the other side abuses the friendship and, you know, they take advantage. So um, I'm just like, well, you know what, they haven't been doing anything for me. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take this opportunity to, to do that. So yeah, it was a little bit risky as yeah. far as, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to burn bridges or, or, or ruin um, friendships, but um, I mean, and I made the decision. I went elk hunting by myself. Um, uh, it was 2017 and Phelps had been, he he sent me some calls. I'm like, Hey man, I'm, I really need some elk calls. These other ones are not working out. Can I, I'll pay you whatever. And he sent me a handful of them and he's like, hey, you don't owe me a thing. I'm like, well, I can't give you any social media love or anything on this. And he's like, no, just use them. So I went hunting. That's by myself and shot at this really nice bull and packing it out by myself. And, you know, I always say I do probably some of my best elk hunting or my best thinking while I'm elk hunting mm. or when I'm by myself, I'm unplugged from everything. And, you know, I, I made that decision right then and there, like, as soon as I get back to service, I'm going to let Phelps know I'm going to, I want to do something. And, um, so yeah, it, it, it was, it was great. Him and I, we, we work really great together. He, <laughs> I like to make fun of him and I think he loves it. Um, so, uh, I try to keep him on his toes as much as possible. And, yeah. and he does, he does the same for me too. I wish he'd kind of, he, <laughs> he'll take a lot of crap and, and I try to put, take him out of his comfort zone as much as I can, especially if we're filming something or whatever. But, um, yeah. I think, I think he loves it. He always tells me he's going to get me back, but, uh, one of the, <laughs> one of these days he'll get me back for sure. That's funny, man. So I'm just, I'm curious, how did the, like, how did the relationship with Meat Eater come about? How did that evolve? So um, we'd been collaborating with those guys to build turkey calls mm. and for about a year. And then they, after a year of that, they approached Jason and wanted to know, hey, would you be interested in, in um, you know, selling your, your company to us and uh, the Meat Eater? And he's like, mm, I don't know. I'm pretty happy. So they, they, they said, well, you know, we'd really love to talk about it. So they talked about it a lot and, um, he opened his books and they looked at everything and, um, just made an offer that he couldn't refuse, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize, you know, Jason was working two jobs basically. So he had a job. He's an, in, he was an engineer for the state of Washington, a civil engineer. So he did a lot of uh, road management stuff and contracts and, and funding for, for roads, um, highways, bridges, whatever. And then he would go home and work like a dog, make, making sure he had um, calls built, whether he had to build them himself or, you know, he had Charlie and Kelly building them as well. Um, but, you know, he was burning both, both ends of the, both ends of the, of the candle there for a yeah. long time. And then they're like, well, if this happens, you're going to have to quit your day job. And he's like, I could probably do that. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm all right with that. So, yeah. so he's, uh, so now it's, uh, so in 2021, um, was when the acquisition happened. So, um, we've been, we've been partnered or working with them ever since. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. It's funny. People always see like, you know, they see the payoff and the headline and like, Oh man, you know, I wish that was me or whatever, but they don't see you working the nine to five coming home and then grinding for three, five, three to five more hours or whatever on side hustle. And then putting in that time for years and then that, you know, that paying off. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, like I would, I would get a hold of him. I'd be like, what are you doing? It'd be like 10 o'clock at night. And he's like, Oh, I'm just making diaphragms. 
<laughs> it'd be sitting there just making diaphragms and, and it's not like it's not fun it's like it's pretty meticulous work you know you gotta yeah you, you gotta pay attention you have to you know it's quite a process it's you know to build one diaphragm um shoot i think there's five or six little things you have to do like little like when i say little i mean not really little but five or six little different processes you have to do before you have a, a finished product yeah. um it's surprising to me that we charge so so little for a diaphragm because it's labor intensive as they are because you have to touch that thing so many times before it's done so they're all but, like still handmade yeah yeah wow yeah yeah we got a couple little little presses and and um a cutter to that 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 uh do all the right things to to crimp and smash and cut and do everything wow. just right um and you have to pay super close attention like you're to the stretch on mm -hmm. the, the latex you have to make sure it's not wrinkly yeah there, there's a lot that goes into it um in fact my wife she built diaphragms for quite a while um and she would be like oh hey can you check this you never so often she'd have me sample one and make sure it's good and they're good but um she's a i mean she was a whiz at it she, she's like all right i'm like i'm gonna make one so then i'm like all right she's all right you're doing it wrong <laughs> okay okay and then um but that's awesome i could make i could make one if i had to yeah but i wouldn't make very many of them it'd, it'd take a long time but phelps is really fast at making them too because he's been oh, doing I bet. it i bet um okay one question i don't want to go down <laughs> this rabbit hole very long because i want to talk about calling but yeah. have you seen as someone who's hunted elk your whole life in Idaho, have you seen, what have you seen as far as elk population in Idaho from when you were a kid hunting till now? Um, it's drastically changed. It's different, like completely different. Um, and it's all because of wolves. Um, we've had a I couple was, bad. I, was, I didn't want to do a leading question, but that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny. Um, even within Idaho itself, there's people, that live in the southern part of the state and they're like ah eh, wolves haven't really created that big of an impact but um the, i think feel like a lot of people live in their little echo chamber of where they where they live you know mm -hmm. um like if if you ask the people in north idaho they're all going to say there's no elk left all the wolves ate them if you ask the people in the southern part of the state they're like oh yeah there's plenty of elk left the, the wolves aren't that bad because there's like there's a definitely a line in this in in the state if you were to um if I were to show you on a map, I, I'd basically tell people, they're like, where should I hunt Idaho? I'm like, well, if you cut off the skinny part. So if you know the shape of Idaho, yeah, it's got the tall skinny part and it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you were to cut it, cut the state and make it into like a rectangular box. Yeah. Anywhere in that rectangular box is probably going to be good elk hunting. Anything above it is very, it's very tough because the wolves have such a, a strong hold there. Jeez. And, um, people say, well, how come, you know, Montana still has a lot of elk and they got wolves and how come Wyoming's got a lot of elk and they got wolves. Um, you, Idaho is unique in where, um, if you look at a map of, of Montana or Wyoming, you got these big mountain ranges, but they're surrounded by, um, lower country, flat ground, um, ranching, um, mm -hmm. private property and stuff where wolves don't thrive as much as they do in Idaho. So in North Idaho, um, where the elk winter, especially in all the rugged, uh, back country, um, whether you're talking about the Frank church, whether you're talking about the clear water, you know, in the bitter roots, um, where the elk winter is just in a, in a, in a river bottom in a river Valley, if you will. And the Valley's yeah. not wide. It's it, the, the mountains come steep down mm -hmm. and then you have a river in the bottom. So before wolves, you know, the elk would come down to a lower elevation, um, they would eat what they could. Um, usually there's quite a bit of food, quite a bit of feed and they would make it through a winter. Well, nowadays when the elk have to come down, they're a very easy target. There's, you know, there's, whether it's a trail or whether it's a road or, or whatever in the bottom, they're easy to locate for, for wolves. And then yeah. they're, they're kind of stuck right there. The elk can't just keep migrating out. Um, they're, they're stuck way in the back country in the bottom of this river valley. So they just, they just don't end up faring very well. Mm. So they, they, I think that's the biggest difference. Um, the elk don't really escape to a, like, um, 
somewhere more civilized in wintertime, whereas in Montana they do, and Wyoming they do as well, whereas a lot of this country where these elk are wintering, you have to have a snow machine to get there. Yeah. If you can, if, if you can even get there with one of those, some of the places like in the Frank church wilderness, I mean, it's, it's the largest wilderness in the lower 48. Mm -hmm. there, there's no getting there without a helicopter or a jet boat. Um, and you can't touch down in the wilderness unless you're on an airstrip. I mean, so there's all these rules and exceptions to where, um, it's just, it makes it easy on the wolves to have a heyday in the wintertime. Yeah. Um, and then just the terrain itself in North Idaho doesn't lend itself to good, be good country to, to, to hunt wolves and control them like they should be. Um, trapping has helped a lot just yeah. because, you know, it's thick timbered, brushy country, it's steep, rugged terrain, hunting wolves up there. is really tough. Last week I went up to North Idaho and um, hunted with a friend, Tom Schneider from stuck in the rut mm -hmm. YouTube channel. And uh, he, he's, he's, been wolf hunting successfully for, for a lot of years but it's still hunting yeah. you, you have to locate them and just because you locate them doesn't mean they're you're just going to go in there and blast a bunch of them like a lot right. of the, the wolf supporters think um you know we located some got in there tried to find them i mean they get they're very sensitive to hunting pressure they're very intelligent yeah. and we, we never did turn up a wolf in in three and a half days so yeah um, yeah it was just i just did a podcast with kate small who i think does the western wolf academy with um your buddy what's yeah. his name again tom 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 tom, yeah. tom schneider I never yeah. met tom but um but yeah that's so i just on that note just to encourage folks to you know i'm trying to encourage folks to and even myself you know get more involved in you know extend your season out a little bit challenge yourself and go out and try to kill a wolf you know <laughs> and learn oh, how yeah. to do it you know we need, we need uh we need to like make wolf hunting cool so we can try to help the the deer and the elk out in idaho man yeah yeah, you know, you talk to, you know, the old timers and then I said, well, I saw a lot of it too, pre-wolf, you know, a lot of that North Idaho backcountry. I mean, it's, it's probably the, some of the best looking elk country you've ever laid your eyes on. It's beautiful country, a lot of feed, a lot of big, deep, nasty holes for elk to hide. Mm -hmm. Lots of, it, it's, it's just like the perfect elk country. Um, you, these days, you know, back in the old days, there were elk in every drainage. These days, you may have to go six drainages before you find a couple elk. I mean, it's there's, it's, it's very patchy. Um, and if, sad. if for a non-resident, I feel bad because for a non-resident to go up there and hunt, they may go 10 days and not even see an elk. Mm -hmm. um, if, because, you know, they're just kind of going in blind. It's like, well, this looks like good elk country. But unless you kind of know the little pockets they live in, you may not even see one uh, unless you get lucky or something. Um, so growing yeah. up there gives me a little bit of an edge. On a lot of that because i kind of know um over the years i kind of watch the progression and know kind of where elk hang out and then it's like well hopefully they'll 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 talk hopefully they'll, be, they'll bugle because uh, they do get pretty quiet when wolves are present yeah i i um uh, i was up in some of that country we were actually mainly deer hunting this last year um the deer numbers are pretty low as well and we yeah we were in there seven days i think and we saw one maybe two elk like but like I'm talking five miles away, um, I had an elk tag, but uh, yeah, very tough. And we saw tons of wolf sign. There was wolf tracks like 50 yards from our tent, um, everywhere. So anyway, um, I will say, you know, towards the front, the front country, I call it. You know, the you know lower elevation. You got a little bit of ag. Um, you got some um, forest ground that's owned by timber mm -hmm. companies. That country there holds some some elk. You know, there's still quite a few elk in there. Um, not like it used to be, but there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of elk in that kind of country. Um, but access is so easy. You know, you can ride a four wheeler or a side by side <laughs> anywhere in that part of the unit. So it just makes hunting them tough. Yeah. Um, but you know, you know, farmers, they have, you know, problems with elk hammer in their wheat fields and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that the elk feel safe there. They've kind of been pushed out of the mountains, and then there was a resident herd of elk there anyway. But what the elk, the wolves didn't eat. They kind of get pushed into places where the elk feel a little more safe. They, they're yeah. they're less scared of man than they are wolves. If that if that if it, yeah. you can believe that, it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's funny. The uh, like the pioneers pushed them from the plains into the mountains, and now the wolves are pushing them from the mountains back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So cool, man. So um, I do want to jump a little bit into some calling stuff because, um, you know, most of my podcasts start off selfishly as the whole podcast kind of did because <laughs> like 
um, you know, I want to know about alt calling and I figure it's also great for the audience. Um, my, you know, kind of who guys I speak to on a lot, of, a lot of my episodes are guys like me coming from the East or the Southeast or whatever, Midwest and, and hunting out, out West. And so I've been kind of on this journey for the last like three or four years and learned a lot and done some cool stuff. But my goal this year was to kill my first elk. I still haven't killed one yet. And so that was my goal. Kill my first elk this year. I've, I've filmed elk hunts. Um, I've, a couple years ago, one of my first things I did was I filmed for Dan Staten out in New Mexico and probably one of the worst units in New Mexico <laughs> <laughs> and had like a just a crazy kind of bad experience. But anyway, not bad. It was fun hunting with Dan, but um, just bad unit. Anyway, long story short. So my goal is to kill my first elk this year. And somehow, like, it's almost like a divine joke, but I drew like an amazing New Mexico tag uh it's a muzzleloader tag um but it's in one of like the really good units in new mexico in mid-october and i also have a montana general rifle elk tag so what i'm going to do is is i'm going to go hunt that five-day season in new mexico and then drive up to montana and for the rifle opener um so anyway man um that's kind of a little bit of context on what i got going so I, you know, from people I've talked to have said that, you know, obviously the rut's not going to be like full swing on that New Mexico hunt because it's in October, but there might be still bugling. So I figured I should at least know how to bugle. So I got your all's, um, you know, the cheater, whatever it's called, the easy oh, bugler yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for, for us guys who didn't grow up elk hunting. Yeah. Um, so, but dude, I love this thing. Um, I can actually, I think make somewhat of a sound that is a decent bugle. Um, and then I have, um, you know, this is not actually a Phelps call. I'm sorry, but um, this is a little exposed reed cow call. I'm pretty decent with that. And then I have a, um, a diaphragm as well that I'm like okay with, but not super confident. So that's kind of where I'm at, man. But I just, I hear a lot of guys talking about different types of bugles or like when to use certain types of bugles. And I know you, I know you've done tons of this kind of information there's lots of information out there in fact how i learned to blow this thing was watching you do it on youtube um but i just thought it'd be cool to get you on and just talk through different scenarios and you know different types of vocalizations and, and when to use them um if you don't mind kind of running yeah. through that with me yeah absolutely you bet and maybe approach it from like okay so i'm going out to new mexico um i'm gonna have two full days and we can, I mean, I know you know more about elk hunting than just calling. So, you know, I'd love any, you know, any advice you could give me. But I'm going on this hunt, like I said, my first uh, first elk hunt. I'm going out two days early to scout. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I got going. Okay. So first thing <laughs> I would do, if that were me going to New Mexico, since I've hunted it three times, is um, I would – before you go, you got to get on your, your map mapping software, whether you're on X or whatever, um, the branded mapping software, get on there. I'm an on guy. Okay. Perfect. Locate all of your, um, all of your water tanks yep. and, and, and springs in your unit. Okay. I go through and I mark them all with a, with a blue, uh, the little water drop icon and I turn them all blue. That way it's just, it e it's easily pops up. If they're easy to find on your map, you're not having to scroll through and zoom in. Yeah. Um, and before I'll you just go, go ahead and tell you, I'm going to bleep this out in the episode, okay. but it's you. Okay. I hunted there last year. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. I think I kind of thought you probably had hunted there before. Yeah. I'm going to mark this time code so I can bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. It's not that big of a deal because it's a straight lottery, but still, I don't want to like drop units. Right. No, you don't want to foul it up for the other folks. That no. So anyway, go. but uh, before you go, um, also download all your maps um, to your yeah, phone, yeah. always um, yep. use it. Well, you know, you got your Wi-Fi or a good service at home. That way you're not on the side of the hill somewhere like, Oh man, I wish I could download this map. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but download them in the highest resolution you can make sure you have plenty of room on your phone. You know, if you got to delete, you know, some funny little cat videos <laughs> off your phone <laughs> and pictures. Um, I mean, pictures of your cat. I know you said you have a cat. Um, you may have to delete some of those cute pics, but, Make sure you have enough space to delete the high re highest resolution maps you can, because 
when you get there for from what i've seen in a lot of new mexico is if you do the low res you don't get some of these little old uh, logging roads the ones that have the little kind of the, the two broken lines yeah they go out through there um which in new mexico those those old roads are typically pretty easy to walk you know you can't take a atv or a truck on them but you can walk them and it's and it gets you you know you may be able to traverse the 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 country a little quicker and easier than if just busting up through the you know the the trees and stuff um have the highest resolution and also it shows it's going to show you all your tanks really well and then so once you get there first thing i would do is start checking the tanks and see which ones have water and which ones don't and then i would probably go through and if if a tank doesn't have water i would remove that icon and just leave the ones that you've verified checked that have water in them um, with um, blue or maybe change the color to purple or something to where you're just like, okay, I have checked these ones. I know these have water, have a little different color. Bam. Nice. Be- because unlike the Northwest, you know, there's Northwest, we have water in every draw almost. It's There's a lot of water. Well, down there, water means everything to the elk. And that's a great place to start once you – um, once the hunt starts, it's like, okay. Um, also during your scouting trip, I'd probably get high, real high up and to a vantage point where you can glass a lot of country. And especially if you can kind of look down in the valley or wherever those, those tanks are at, you know, you could look where the tank is, but look where the elk are going to come from. So they're probably going to come from above, uh, somewhere, you know, up on the mountain. So use, use your evenings and mornings to glass, try to locate yeah. elk that way. And then hit tanks midday. Yeah. Drive around. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you can do some bugling and stuff too. I mean, um, just to kind of test the waters and see if you can, can hear anything. Um, but I think you'll probably find more value with it, checking the tanks and, and glassing that first and last light, um, just to kind of see where the elk are at, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And then, because typically we would start our morning in the dark, um, before it got light at the tanks and calling and you'd hear bugles and then you just chase bugles from the tank up to their bedding area um, for the day and then new mexico elk were weird because they just didn't bed that long they would they would bed down for an hour or two and then they'd get up and move Mm -hmm. and i don't know if it's because i'm I'm sure some folks that hunt new mexico all the time you know locals probably have be able to tell better than me but um, i have kind of an opinion i think you know, the shade, the trees that are just really small. There's not a lot of shade. They don't offer a lot of shade. So mm-hmm. I think their shade tra- changes to where it's like, okay, we can't lay here anymore and, and remain cool. We got to get up and move over to the next spot. Yeah. And, and also New Mexico is an unforgiving uh, place. There, there's not a lot of soft places to sit down <laughs> and, and enjoy like a, a good, a good solid rest. Like, uh-huh. and a lot of those places, elk were bedding is just like, yeah. It doesn't look that comfortable to me. I mean, I, I would have a hard time laying there all, all day long. I, I can imagine a big animal would have the same problem too. So, um, yeah. So they're, they're probably going to move around. So, which is challenging because typically other places where we hunt, we would wait till they get in their bedding area, get close. We let them set for a, a couple hours, get in there in the middle of the day, like 12 to one o'clock for that midday madness period, I call it, get in there and then start trying to call them out of their bedroom. Um, that works really good for elk that don't want to leave their bedroom, but New Mexico, for me, um, elk didn't really want to stay in their bedroom very long. And with a little bit of pressure in the middle of the day, they would get up and just leave. Sometimes they wouldn't even give a peep. They would just get up and walk out quiet and you wouldn't even know it till you got in there, like super close. And it's like, man, you'd call to them. There's nothing. You move up, move up pretty soon. It's like, all right, well, here's their tracks. Here's where they were, but they Houdini, you know, they're, yeah. they're long gone. So that, so they are a little different to hunt than a lot of other places. Okay. Um, but Phelps, he's, he's hunted that, that muzzleloader season. Um, I think it's like the first week of October or something. Is that the same one you're going? Yeah. It's second week of October. Second week of October. He said that, um, bulls were still pretty vocal. Um, they liked cow calls a lot then, um, um, bugles, you know, to locate and cow calls to get them close. Um, everybody's got some, some information. Everybody's got some, some, uh, advice for New Mexico, uh, including myself, but, and you can take it for whatever it's worth, but everybody's, you know, before I ever went to New Mexico, they're like, oh yeah, don't, don't bugle, just cow call, just cow call. They love cow calls. 
Um, well, I found that that's not, that wasn't always true. Sometimes they didn't give a crap about a cow call, but if I bugled, it'd get them fired up. And especially if I'd give some big monster, nasty bugles hmm. that would really like for the, the herd bulls, that would really get them going. Like that, um, those like guttural, like yeah. type ones. Yeah, where you, they call it a lip ball. That's where you buzz your lips. Yeah, and, and you do that big. Is scream. that the one where you're holding it like sideways? Yeah, for your for your particular call, you you hold that easy bugler sideways on your lip and you just <laughs> buzz your lips. Okay, and uh, it gives that real gravelly sound to do uh, bugle. It's kind of hard to do even with a diaphragm, and and a lot of folks kind of struggle with it. So if you don't feel like you can do a good one. It's okay to use your voice. You just put some inflect enough voice yeah. in it to, to where it's gravelly enough mm -hmm. to um, sound sound wicked. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And so then a lot sometimes of the the big, like you're saying, gravelly bugles actually got them got them going, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. People are like, oh yeah, don't ever bugle at Elk in New Mexico. And I'm like, well, cow calls ain't working. We watched this big bull pushing this cow across an open hillside, and I cow called. I gave him the the sweetest cow calls you ever seen. He wouldn't even, he would not even look our way. And so I just started ripping these giant nasty bugles and he had a nasty bugle himself. So I was trying to mimic his bugles. And the first time I did one, he'd stop dead in his tracks and just stared at us. Like, who is that? <laughs> and he started, and he, then he would start to bugle. And as soon as he opened his mouth and started bugling, I would cut him off with another one. And about three, after three of those, that thing turned right around, left that cow and started running. He come running right over to us and come in and he came in wrong. You know, we said we were, we we're kind of caught cause he come kind of come so quick. Um, and it was pretty open country. So that we we're talking this ridge top. And as it goes, it kind of, you have a little bit of a crown where it starts sloping off. Mm -hmm. Elk are notorious for like coming right below that crown and looking up. So all you get to see is their head. Right. Mm. Um, and I thought I moved up far enough to where I'm like, I think I'd be able to shoot if he comes below that crown. And uh, pretty soon here he comes. He comes in and uh, an elk love to do this thing as well. So he walks right behind this big deadfall. And uh -huh. these, this deadfall has got these big nasty branches just going up. It was completely shielded from, from an arrow. I mean, you can't shoot through that. Right. Um, he was within range, but... Uh, no shot. So he stops right behind that deadfall, looks around. There's no elk standing there. So gone. He runs, yeah. runs back to his cows. Wow. So then, so when he did that, we, the chase was on. We, we chased right after him. We crossed the draw, climbed up that hill right where he went. And all the while I'm just ripping those big nasty bugles. I told Phelps, I'm like, I think I got a migraine headache from bugling so much. I, <laughs> I bugled so hard for so many times in a row. And we, as soon as we got to the top of that next ridge where he went, we heard a bugle pretty close and we separated and here comes a bull. And it was a different bull. It was actually a better one. Uh, I don't think, it, I don't think he was as old as that other one, but he was a really good bull, like mm -hmm. as far as antler size. And uh, that thing just come stomping up the hill and Jason whacked it. Um, oh, nice. But so anyway, back to the point, like, here's how I see elk calling. It, it's an experiment. You know, people are going to tell you all, a lot of different tactics and, and ways to do it and, and what, what may be a surefire method. But my only surefire method is to experiment hmm. and see what elk are, re are re actually reacting to. So if they're not reacting to the calls you're doing, uh, maybe mix it up maybe instead of doing if you've been doing a bunch of cow calls it's like well that's not working they don't give a crap about that well i'm gonna bugle at them if the bugles aren't working maybe i'm gonna shut up entirely and then just get as super close as i can without getting spotted and just kind of shadow the herd and then get really super close and then maybe cow call or, or bugle once they get close maybe not um and i found that that worked pretty good for new mexico just you don't want to bugle from where you're at all the way to the bowl. Um, you want to shut up, get close. And then if, mm. if you feel like calling is, would be good at this time, then you want to call when you're really, really close to them. That way, all they have to do is come just to, you know, maybe 50 yards to see you yeah. and, and then you'll get your shot. Is um, there ever a time when like, you're like, you should definitely not call. Cause I like the fact that it's kind of experimental. Like you're saying, it almost sounds like you can kind of just throw some stuff out and see what's working. But is there ever a time where it's like, Oh, you should definitely not call right now or not call um, a certain way. 
Yeah, I feel like if, especially if the, the they've been like pushed and messed with a lot. Um, let's say there's been other hunters in the area and they've been bugling at them, or maybe, or maybe you're the culprit. Maybe you've been chasing them for two or three days. These same elk, um, and they're kind of wise to your calling. They're like, oh yeah, you call, and then they just keep drifting off. You might just shut up at that point and be like, all right, I got to let them talk on their own and just just get close, be quiet, get up, and then just wait till wait till they get in a, into a spot where um, I have the upper hand to like sneak in on them, which can yeah. be sometimes tough. I mean, sometimes elk won't present. They'll go lay down or go hang out in an area that it's just no game. You just can't, you yeah. can't make your approach because of wind or cover. And at that point, um, and it's so hard not to do this. It's so hard not just to run down there and, and, and force it. You know, it's like, no, I, I found these elk. I'm close. I got to make, I got to make this happen. I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice. You know, the wind may not be perfect, but I'm going to try it. You just can't, you can't, for me, I can't take that risk. I'm just going to, I'm going to wait until maybe, maybe it's not today. Maybe I won't get my shot today, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah. I'll get my shot um, and then I'll get in a close. Um, but yeah, it, especially pressured elk. If you can tell that they're not, they're not digging the calls at all. I would just shut up and, yeah. and sneak in, you know, move swiftly. Anytime you have like a, put a ridge between them and you where they can't see you and just move swiftly, get over there, get on the same contour line and then slowly work your way over there and just kind of find out where they're at at that point and, and uh, just kind of assess wind and cover at that point. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think you're so experienced, um, that you kind of just know like different types of bugles and cow calls, but like, just talk to me and like, you know, for the audience as well, like, um, for guys that are just really starting off like me, like, br- could you break down the different, cause I know there's, I don't know if there's different names for it, but I've, I've heard guys talk about like different, um, you know, like levels of emotion even that you might put into a cow call. If you could just like break down the the types of calls, both cow and bugles, and like, you know, when you might break those out. Sure. So <clears throat> before I talk about that real quick, I'll talk about the like an external call too. These yeah, open, that's what open I got read. Right now. Yeah. Expose read, open read. Um a lot of guys have told me that, oh yeah, those southwestern elk love those kind of calls. So um, I'm like, oh yeah, I got this. So I start to- tooting on one of these things, and it didn't seem to make any difference. Um, but if if the elk is reacting to it, um, definitely go to it. So feed them bugles, feed them diaphragm cow calls, feed them external cow calls, whatever it takes, whatever they're digging, just keep feeding them that. So um, as far as bugles, so there's kind of there's a I don't, some, some people like to kind of like break it down and get super granular on, um, what the elk is saying mm-hmm. with their bugle. And I'm, I'm not of the camp that a hundred percent believe that they're, they're maybe speaking a language, like they're saying words in elk words by the, how they bugle. I feel like the more of the intensity because all, mm. so many bulls have so many different ways they call, you know, one bull may just the way he talks is sounds like this and another bull he it sounds big beautiful crisp robust bugles uh and grunts or chuckles and another bull will bugle and it'll sound like a teenager like Bleh! it'll sound weird and like <laughs> is that an elk or a guy or maybe somebody's calling pigs over there i mean the, there's so many different voices like i'm not i'm not so sure about that i'm not going to say they're wrong but i don't know if i believe that but maybe could be true um that they're actually saying some kind of words but what i've found to be true is the level of intensity you know you can hear it in a bull's voice um whether it's just kind of a just an average sounding bugle or one that sounds super dramatic something that's like whoa wow he sounded really mad that time yeah um you you can hear that emotion and that's the kind of emotion you got to put in your calls um and i feel like that's where some people struggle with some of the the different calls on the market, especially the external calls on the market is they're very limited to, to how much emotion you can put into your call. So it just ends up kind of coming off as the same, just the same kind of call over and over again. And pressured elk, especially Doug Flutie, as Dan Doug, would say, <laughs> Doug Flutie, if you will, <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, pressured elk, they know the difference. They, they're like, mm, I've been fooled by that before. Um, and I smelled a guy or whatever. I seen the guy or smelled the guy or, or, or maybe it just doesn't, that tone just doesn't speak to them. You know, it's just like, so what? Picture this, you're at the mall and the mall's noisy and you just hear some conversations. None of that speaks to you. You just like, you're walking along and you can hear people talking, but none of it means anything. But you got somebody that's like, oh, hey, I don't like your beard. And, you know, they're, they're kind of being a little bit aggressive and, you know, it's a little bit insulting. Yeah. Or, hey, your girlfriend, dang, she's fine. You know, <laughs> I mean, that you're going to find that insulting yeah. a little bit. So I feel like if you can put some emotion behind your calls, um, that's going to definitely make it better. And people kind of get hung up and they're like, man, I just don't sound very good when I call. I don't sound like Dirk or I don't sound like my favorite YouTube star or whatever. Um, don't get hung up on that um, because there's a lot of elk that sound really weird. Hmm. And what, what makes, I mean, elk, other elk reply to them, but it's kind of the emotional aspect. If, if you sound like, like, eh, I don't sound perfect, but man, I sound wicked mean sometimes, or I sound, you know, wimpy or, you know, be able to have a, give a wimpy bugle all the way up to like level 11, right? You yeah. want to like, it sounds like you're going to, you, that you want to kill the other elk. And, um, that's the kind of the bugles that you have to have the, that range to call them, um, and to, to get that reaction for them to like come in and want to fight. Yeah. So for instance, here's just kind of a, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a, just a wimpy bugle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Just okay. kind of a, a weak sheepish bugle. And some people will tell you, Hey, that's the only kind of bugle you should be doing. Don't ever bugle big because you'll just scare them off, especially herd bulls. They don't want that competition. They want um, that, that little, that little bull is no threat. So they're not scared of it, but I feel like big herd bulls. I'm the opposite. I want to give them yeah. the same equal sounding bugle, like somebody that sounds like actually a rival. Right. He's like snort already... wheezing at a deer, like, right. like, some, like a real challenge, not like a, eh. <laughs> right. Cause if you get close, especially in their bedroom, uh, in most places, um, if you get close and you sound like a real threat, they're going to want to stop you. They're like, that sounds like a threat. If you just, we have this little wimpy bugle and you just sound like a little raghorn satellite. He's not going to get out of his bed to run you off. Yeah. You know, he's just like, eh, there's the kid over there, you know, trying to try to learn how to bugle. Yeah. But if you sound like a real threat, like you sound equally as, pissy or pissed off as him or equally as you know mature as him um they're like that's a real threat yeah and at, and at that point um they're gonna want to come and investigate or kick you out of their 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 little bubble so here here's a really nasty um bugle can we talked about before that lip ball that's where i buzz my lips and i do a big scream <laughs> So some people and it's call it like that, quick too, not like it's like Wah. yeah, it's short. It it uh, conveys a lot of emotion. Um, I, I wanted him to think like that was a big threat. I'm, I'm talking to to him. I'm talking to his ladies and saying, "Hey, I'm coming in. I'm taking your girls, and I'll kill you if I have to." I want that bull to understand that. Yeah. Um, if but if you go in there like this. with a little squirrely sound and bugle like that, they, they don't seem to get the same reaction. Um, now there's a time and a place for that kind of a bugle, but not after you've located a herd bull and you've gotten close to his bedding area, you want him to feel threatened. You want him to stand up and be like, it'd be no different than having a crackhead standing on your sidewalk. If there's a crackhead standing on your sidewalk, you're going to be like, you're going to take note. And if that guy steps in your yard, yeah, you're going to, if you're aggressive, <laughs> yeah. you're going to be like, Hey, get the hell out of here. Right. Or you're gonna call the cops or whatever. You're gonna take some action to remove that person from the situation. Yeah. That bull's going to take some action to remove you from his situation. He's got these cows bedded down. He don't want you coming in there and messing it up. He's got a good thing going. If you come in, if you make it to his cows, his day, he's going to have a bad day because cows are going to start running around all over the place. He's going to have to fight. Um, 
and and maybe his herd will get split up and maybe you'll take some of his cows. Yeah. He doesn't want to have, have that happen. So when would be the time to use the wimpy one? So let's say you're or trying like to look- less aggressive, I guess. Yeah. So, and I like to say too, um, you don't want to start out your conversation with a bull um, at level 11 either right. uh, or level 10. You want to like feel the situation out, whatever temperature he's at, you want to, you want to give him the same kind of a, a, same kind of a level. So if he's just like, if he bugles kind of medium, then you want to bugle medium and then let him escalate to where he gets mad. So um, in most cases, so sometimes you hear those bulls in the bedding area. Um, maybe, maybe you want to slow play this. Maybe he's in a bad spot. The wind's bad. It's maybe tough terrain to get over there. And then you're in your limit on time. It's like, well, I don't have enough time to get over there. We have to go, or I don't have enough water, or maybe I'm feeling lazy. I don't want to crawl across that nasty Canyon um, to get to that bull. If he's just laying over in his bed, just giving that w- wimpy squirrely bugle, then I'm going to sit there and I'm going to peck at him with wimpy squirrely bugles. So every time he answers, and it may be three to five minutes in between bugles, every time he answers, I'm going to give him one of those. But before I bugle back at him, every time he answers with one of these, that kind of just a squirrely bedded bugle, I'm going to give him some cow calls. Pretty loud pretty excited like i want him to know i'm talking directly to him i want to tr- i'm trying to say hey i like the way you sound and i've got a guy over here and he's a real jerk and i wish you'd come save me <laughs> <laughs> and this is what's i've got in my head now whatever the elk's thinking could be can be completely different and I there's probably you. there's probably some guys that are like yeah that ain't that ain't true but for <laughs> me this is this is what's worked so then i set my my well after i do those cow calls then i'll bugle like Again, I'll be like, hey, girls, be quiet. But I'll give him one of those squirrely bugles. But what I'll do is I'll run a timer. So from the time I bugle to the next time he bugles, I run a timer on my phone and see how long that is. Two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, whatever it is. I'm like, wow, eight minutes in between bugles. So I'm not going to try to, I don't want to, I don't want to force the frequency of him, how often he bugles. I'm just want to, I want to trick him into like keep talking. Mm-hmm. But I want to trick trick him into like getting mad eventually. So um, I'm going to keep pecking at him little by little, and this may take an hour or two of these wimpy bugles. But and this doesn't work every time, but I have had it work a few times, and it, and it, when it worked, it worked really good. Um, eventually, at some point in the conversation, at maybe after an hour, he he gives you like a full bugle. <laughs> When he does that, I know I got him because he stood up out of bed. He's just like, hey, man, I've had enough of this. Yeah. (laughs) Or, hey, ladies, I'm coming to get you. So when he does that, I escalate. I give him him a bugle that sounds just like what he did. I'm going to give him the same intensity. Now, maybe I can't sound exactly like him, but I'm going to give the same intensity Mm -hmm. as what he did. But at first, but first I'm going to bugle, um, or excuse me, at first I'm going to cow call again, like, hey, <laughs> give these really high pitched, long cow calls. The, and the kind of longer is more like, I've heard some people say like, it's almost like more desire or emotion in the cow yeah. call. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. get over here, big guy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah. I'm putting more of that longing or yearning in the, type yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, in the call. Um, and then I'll bugle at him, but then when he finally escalates to where he sounds like he's pissed, he, he takes it up a notch, then that's when I take it up a notch. So in this situation, I'm going to make sure I definitely don't escalate before he does. Yeah. And after, once he escalates a couple times, a lot of times I, it's next time I hear him, well, once he stands up out of bed, he escalates first. And then the next time he's in a different spot, maybe he's a hundred yards from where he'd been laying all afternoon. Mm-hmm. And then the next time I hear him, he's in the creek or down in the bottom of the draw. And the next time he's climbing, the next time I hear him, he's climbing up and he's halfway to me. So once he gets halfway to me, I start really like being 
more quiet. I don't want to start doing a bunch more like, oh man, I get excited. Like this is working. I want to double my efforts on calling. No, it's really hard to do. You have to really resist on doing that. So what I'll typically, once he gets on my side, when he bugles, then I'll cut him off, but I'll point my tube mm. directly away from me off to the side a little bit and bugle off to the side above me if he's coming, you know, up the hill. And I will also cover it into my tube. I want him to think away. I want him to think I'm just a little further up on the hill. Once he come once he got on my side, he can't hear quite as good. So I'm gonna give him make him think, oh, he's up there further. That way he he walks further up the hill before he wants to hang up. Yeah. Okay. And I've killed some pretty good bulls doing that um, over the years and had some really close encounters where I should have killed. Last year I did this on the last day of the hunt. We were very we had to leave at noon. And it was like 1130 when we found this bull. I'm like, well, we can't. Oh, OK, we can't leave at noon. We have to wait until we call him in and kill him or screw it up. And he was across this big, nasty basin. It would have, it was a, it would have taken the rest of the day to hunt that bull had we went to him. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm like, we don't have time. So let's give this an hour here and see if we can get him over on our side. Oh, nice. And, uh, and he didn't do a lot of calling like. Um, and in fact, I kind of did a little bit different. I. I try to do the like the slow play thing or that where I, I just give him wimpy bugles and he didn't really want that. So then I'm like, OK, let's start a big melee. Just it sound like an elk, <laughs> elk extravaganza. I'm like I'm bugling every 10 seconds. And I'm making these wild cow calls and stuff. And I did that. And then he completely shut up when I did that. Are you mixing in raking in there, too, as well? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm throwing if people would have seen me from a distance, they've been like, that guy's crazy. What's wrong with that guy? Because I was <laughs> running around in circles breaking brush and raking and throwing rocks down the hill and just making yeah. all this ruckus, like something's going on up there. And what happened is that, that completely shut him down. Yeah. He completely shut up. So then after he did that, I did this for like 30 minutes and then I, I shut up and I quit. I didn't call anymore. Yeah. And after did about, thir after about 15 minutes, he's just like, what happened? And then he bugles. And then after like two minutes, he bugles like, Hey, what happened to those elk over there? So That's then I bugled at him. I, I bugled at him to let him know there's still something going on in a cow called. And uh, pretty soon, it took a while. He didn't bugle much, and it took him a long time to get come in. But the next time I heard him, he was halfway down his side of the hill. And then he bugled again at the creek. And then again, and then I didn't hear anything for like 15 minutes. It took him 15 minutes to climb 300 feet. Um, and I thought, what's the deal? I, he must have winded this. And then after like 15, I'm standing there like ready to draw my bow at any second. I know he's going to pop out or bugle. And then he bugles like 60 yards away. And oh, I think nice. the, the fatal flaw was he, um, when he bugled, I, I, I cal called behind me, but I cal called too lightly where he may, may not have heard me. Yeah. And he, he kept on going right up the hill, right up to where that party was. So we partied up here with all those sounds. Then we moved away from that spot to try to intercept him on his way to that spot and then off to the side that way he could get a broadside shot oh, nice but he passed he bypassed us and didn't ever expose himself he stayed in the trees he went nice. right up there to where we were at and um and got our wind and started barking at us so i barked wow. at him and this is crazy he barked he got our wind barked at us i barked back and screamed and then i i run up there and I, I, weren't, I run right up on him. He was like 20 yards away. And he was a dandy bull. And he went in the brush. And I was like, oh, I think I can shoot through that little hole in the brush. I'll get him. And I shoot and miss. But, but anyhow, <laughs> it happens. you can modify that slow play, you know, depending on what your scenario is, you know, whether you want to do just those wimpy bugles the whole time until they escalate. Or I would have probably played it out a little slower, but I was such a – a time crunch i thought well i'm gonna do this big rut fest melee sound you know lots of bugles lots of cow calls lots of action going on up here and see if we can appeal to that side so there's a couple different ways you can do that yeah um, but it worked and so i don't want to we're coming closer on time here so i don't want to yeah. go too deep into it but like it did bring up the question of like raking and stuff so i'm just i'm assuming and correct me if i'm wrong but as you're kind of ex or increasing that amount of um hostility and aggression and just intensity that's when you kind of start to mix in the raking and different stuff like that i'm assuming right right 
So yeah. I, I only rake whenever I'm at my setup, right? Um, so during that big melee, I was I wanted to create an illusion of something was really going on over there. A bull rubbing, a bull raking, a bull screaming, chasing cows around. Um, but that's not your typical scenario. Your typical call-in scenario is I hear the bull bugle. Um, I could get him to talk a couple times, and then I, I shut up and I go walk over his side of the canyon and try to get as close as I can. And then once I get close and I bugle and he responds and he starts coming my way, once he kind of hangs up, once he gets to that hang up spot and starts raking, that's when I start raking. So gotcha. it doesn't really do you any good to like stand on the other side of the canyon and rake um, <laughs> and then and then walk over there to him. I, you, you want to do that at the at the final end where you're kind of set up, you've done some raking, whether you're with a partner or not. Um, that's, that's the time you really want to do the raking. Okay. Um, last or, okay. You hear a lot of guys say like, um, locator bugles. Like if I want to throw out some bu bugles, like when I'm scouting or just to kind of see what's in the area, what's that kind of sound like? So there's a couple locator bugles. They're just kind of a non-aggressive, uh, kind of a long, long bugle. <laughs> Okay. Or something like that, or okay. And they can even be a little longer if you wanted, but um, typically I just do those without any chuckles or grunts, and just kind of listen to what's out there. So um, let me try one, see how you think it sounds. Okay. Man, Too I much like da da da. Well, it didn't pick it up. Oh, it didn't um, pick it up. Oh, it probably I, maxed out the volume. I did, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, you just you do that full scale. Da -da -da, hold that high note for a while and then just drop it off. Is it like three um, jumps? Like da -da -da. Yeah, three, three, four jumps, whatever, whatever you can do. Uh, some people struggle with that high note. You know, even if you can't hit that high note, that's okay because there's a lot of bulls that have kind of a moany, weird bugle that doesn't have a real high pitch to it. Yeah. Um, let me try one thing here and see if I can get it to not. Um, I think in your settings, uh, yeah. I've had this happen before. In the audio somewhere. I'm trying to see if I can um, take off the noise gate thing. Yeah, that's what I've had to do. Um, see if this works. <laughs> it didn't work. Could you hear it? Looked it? Like, no, it looked like you were trying to take a drink out of a wine bottle or something. <laughs> Drinking straight from the bottle. <laughs> uh, dang. Well, maybe it's a good thing you can't hear my, my uh, bugles, but um, I don't know. I don't want to spend too much time messing with it. But um, basically, the, 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 the bugle that I kind of naturally defaulted to as non experienced sounded a lot like your locator bugle. So uh -huh. that's probably a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's non aggressive. It doesn't really say something. So if you. You don't want to try to call in your bowl with just doing those over and over and over again because it just doesn't really speak to the mood. You know, you want to create a mood of aggression. You want to get him wound up to where he wants to fight. Yeah. Um, if you're not sitting over there kind of insulting him or, you know, you, you do that a few times, cool. You located him. Now it's time to get close. Now, whenever you get up close, you want to talk to him a little different. You want to put a little, make the, the bugle a little shorter, uh, maybe put a little bit more, more um, rasp or a little bit more emotion to it. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of feel it out. Whatever he's doing, it's kind of what you want to do. And then, you know, like the, that level of emotion. And then when he escalates, you escalate. Yeah. Um, and some people say, well, I, I suck at grunts and chuckles. You don't have to grunt and chuckle. Um, some people say um, they prefer you not to grunt and chuckle. And the chuckle um, is the, at the end of the call and is like, meow, 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 yeah. At the end. So, so a chuckle is a lot quicker, faster pace. And a grunt is a little short, slower pace. So let me do um, both of them. Here's a chuckle. And here's a grunt. The notes are a little longer. It's a little shorter cadence. Um, so whatever the bull's doing, if you can mimic that. Just match it. That match it. Okay. Um, some people say, oh, yeah, you can't kill, kill elk with with by using those i've 
literally chuckled in bull. That's all the bull was doing was chuckling. Yeah. And I did, I matched that and then they come in. So, cool. um, if La- you want to keep it as simple, you just want to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. You know, and if you're unsure, just do what the, the bull's doing, you know, and, and just kind of play it from there because you, you can make it as complicated as you want, or you can make it as simple as you want. Um, I found it's easier just to make it simple. Yeah. And that's what I love. I feel like this conversation has like made me feel a lot better because it's almost kind of like, just don't overthink it. You know what I mean? Just kind of yeah. like match the intensity. It sounds like you can't, I'm sure like in certain pre- situations, there are ways you could totally screw things up, but it seems like as long as you're not being an idiot and you're using common sense and matching the intensity, you're probably not going to screw it up. doesn't mean they aren't going to just run straight at you, but you right. might not probably not going to like screw it up too bad. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, exactly. What is this thing? I've seen Dan doing this a bunch. So that's glunking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your glunking didn't even come across. It doesn't it's not as loud on this one. Yeah, I can't hear it at all. Hmm. I think your I think your audio hates it. Yep, it's cutting it out. Okay. Well, so we gotta fix that. So I'm just hitting the the large end of the uh, the exit hole of the tube with the flat palm of my hand, and I'm just kind of bouncing it on there. So a bull elk makes that noise, and I'm not sure exactly where he's making it with. Uh, I think he's making it with a, a piece of meat in his throat somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Some people say, "Oh no, that's his, that's his thing slapping on his belly," or that's a, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, he's doing this or that. He's doing it with his tongue, and I'm not really sure. I haven't had anybody actually pin down that said, "Well, here's how." Here's how it's made. Yeah. Um, you know, it's made a question for a biologist, maybe. Yeah. This is somebody that's really good with anatomy. Um, but, you know, why would you do that? I'm like, if a bull's doing it, typically um, the understanding is a lot of time he's following a cow along and he's, and he's making that noise mm. um, as he's talking to her. But I've had bulls come in that had no cows doing it, but I have been cow calling. So maybe that, maybe that's, exactly what he's doing i haven't been able to quantify or qualify what what's right or wrong there but i do know um that if i do it it's not really made any difference and if i don't do it it doesn't make any difference so Mm. typically i don't really do it because it it it, the the sound actually kind of sounds kind of like that but not really i mean okay when you hear it in real life in the woods you're like Okay, yeah, that sounds kind of like a guy doing that, beating on the end of his tube, but but not really. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's mostly not really. I mean, it, it sounds similar, but yeah. If I were an elk, I'd be like, "That's not it. That's not glunk. That's not glunk." <laughs> so okay, well, I'll, I'm not going to worry about that one. But um, well, cool, man. Um, well, good. I, oh, I do. I, I was going to talk just real quick. Yeah, about, yeah. I, I'm know, good on time. I just want to respect okay. your time. Yeah, sure. So cow calls. I want to kind of talk about those real quick. Absolutely. Um. Some people, they love to just like, take all their cow calls to level 10 all the time. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> they'll do that to, you know, a few, and then they'll like wait for the response. Um, it's a little too excited for me. Uh-huh. Um, in normal conditions, when there's not a lot of cow activity going on, cows are pretty laid back. They're just going to sound... That high pitch, that's calf mm-hmm. calls. Cow calls is more lower pitch. That's that's ninety percent of my cow calls. Now, once I get a bull interested, then I, st- I I'll switch to those more excited, more yearning, longing cow calls. Something like that. And now, when you when you're breaking you're breaking those out when you're kind of really trying to get the bull's attention more I guess yeah once I've established contact with him and he's talking to me then I'll start I'll kind of I'll escalate with those those more yearning type cow calls because okay. I really want him to talk to my cows my bugle to my cows that way I can bugle at him and say hey don't don't talk to my cows and you girls shut up okay um and then there's like the estrus type of calls you know they're kind of like People want to do like those estrus type of calls and they love them. They love doing them with an external read too, because you can get a little more nasally. Get that, you draw out that long note a long ways. Um, 
I've tried those a lot. I'm, I don't, I don't see it being a, a silver bullet. Yeah. Um, there's some people will tell you, oh yeah, you do this one call. This is silver bullet. The, it works 60% of the time. It works every time. <laughs> it's got bits of real Panther in it. So you know, it's good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I've never found that. I, I found that, um, whatever the bull likes is kind of the silver bullet. Like whatever he's sure. responding to the best, just keep giving him those. Yeah. Um, in hunting, there is no silver bullet. It's like, there's nothing right. like that. <laughs> right. Right. In fact, I've had bulls, um, they wouldn't even respond to a cow call. Like they didn't care. You, yeah. you would, you could cow call and they wouldn't talk. And if you beagle, bam, they'd answer. They're very aggressive. Um, so if, if that's, it's okay to, you're not probably not going to mess it up too much by giving, throwing in a few cow calls. I always like to throw in a few, just to be like, well, if you come up here and fight, there's, there's something, you know, worthwhile right. here. You know, you, you could sniff these cows or maybe take some home with you. For um, sure. but I'm going to, I'm going to call to whatever appeals to that bull the most. Yeah. So you just, it's an, it's an experiment. Do you think it would be still potentially effective to use that even later into the season, like into October and stuff like that? The asterisk call? Um, yeah, I think so. Or is that more of a so. September call? No, I think so. I think you could use it in October. Uh, no problem. Um, Phelps, I know he, they, they did really well. And I think with open read calls there in October in New Mexico, so yeah. I wouldn't hesitate with it, you know, throw, throw some stuff out there and see what they're, they, they're digging, you know? Yeah. Um, it sounds good, man. And I feel like every year is a little different, right? Mm-hmm. So one, one year in the same spot, you're going to be like, oh man, this place is on fire and they answered everything. And the next year they can't hardly buy a beagle. That was the same. That was the case for Phelps and I. So um, the previous year he hunted the same unit um early here in the first season of september um he's like man we couldn't do anything wrong he said bulls were just come right in um this year they struggled they struggled hard to like get bulls to respond and then try not to push them off because they didn't want to hear bugles or cow calls he said it was just it was really tough hunting and then i hunted that same spot two weeks two weeks later on the uh on the second season Mm-hmm. And bulls were talking, but still they, they weren't super excited about me, you know, pushing up on them with bugles. So, um, they did like cow calls a bit. Um, I ended up calling in a calf or I, I ended up calling in my bull with a calf call, just strict, strict calf calls. He was in his bed. Got a file bull. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, got really close to his bed to where it was like, I'm going to, we're going to get spooked this thing off. And then I just started giving these tiny little calf calls. Just two or three, just about as quiet as I could make them. And he responded from his bed. He was like 50 yards away. And then he gets up out of his bed and then slowly took him a long time to come in. And he bugled two or three times and uh, I was able to get a shot. But um, you nice. just have to adapt, you know, whatever you think, you know, it's it's fun ripping big bugles and, and doing that. But if the elk aren't having it, then abandon that and do what what's going to work. You know, maybe yeah. they just want cow, cow calls. Maybe they want calf calls. Maybe you should just put your calls away and shut up and let them do the talking and get close to them. I know there's a lot of really good hunters in New Mexico that use that tactic. Um, they're probably going to kill way bigger and way more elk than I'll ever kill just by being quiet and getting close. For sure, man. Yeah. That's always a good option. Um, have you ever hunted uh, that Montana rifle season? I have. More of I our, have. You have. Are they vocal at all during that, or is it mainly a spot and stock type game? So here's my advice. If you can go three days early before the season opens. It all depends on how, if I get lucky in New Mexico, because that okay. the season ends on 18th and then the okay. next one opens the 21st. So if I do end up hunting all five days in New Mexico, it's going to be like, just get. <laughs> you don't even stop. You just keep yeah. on going. Do not, <laughs> do not go by home. Just go yep. keep going to, to Montana. Well, if you can, even a day, a day before season. Yeah. If I local, can, I'm going to do everything in my power to get there as early as possible. Now, I know everywhere is a little different in Montana, but the place I went, it was like they were handing out free rifles or something at the, at the trailhead. <laughs> there were, I'm, it's one of the most busy places I've ever seen. Uh, there were camps everywhere and lots of people in camp and there was a lot of elk there, but every, every I, I got there, um, the night before set up my tent in the dark. And so I didn't have any, I'd never been to this place before. I just seen it on maps. 
So I didn't really know where I was going. Well, then a big storm blew in. So you couldn't even see the mountains. It's like, well, I don't even know where to climb up the mountain here. Yeah. Um, visibility is about to 50 yards because it was just blowing snow, just a blizzard. But the guys who got there, I'm, I'm assuming they probably got there two or three days early, spotted the elk, and then they just camped on it. They just got up early and knew right where to go. Uh, I saw lots of, a lot of bulls in the back of pickups later on. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would recommend that get there early. If you can spot them, um, sit on them for a couple of days until the opener and then go in and shoot one. Nice. Um, yeah. It sounds good on paper, but yeah, it's hunting, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be fun, man. I think between both tags, Lord willing, I'll come out with at least one. I'm not going to be picky really, honestly. So, um, but yeah, man, it's going to be fun. I appreciate your time. How was the last question? How was the pressure on that New Mexico hunt when you were down there? I guess it's archery, so it's a little different, but. Yeah, I've seen a few guys driving around. Um, not, not crazy. But the, I never seen a rig parked hunting. Um, hmm. I did hear one guy, it sounded like Doug Flutie, that was <laughs> um, molesting a, like a chihuahua or something down at the bottom. Of the, <laughs> the day I killed my bull, like I could hear him bugling down. He must have been sitting on a water tank. And he yeah. was just making these god awful bugles, and the elk wouldn't answer him. Yeah. Um, and then um, we got close to that bull that I got, and was able to take him. And nice. But that was about it. It was it was not not a lot of pressure, at least in yeah. the place I was at. So cool. Well, of the other other guys out there like me who are just starting out, I do recommend this call. It was Easy Bugler, right? Yeah, Easy Bugler with the metal tube. Yeah. Um, if I can and, figure it out, I guarantee you, you can. So where can yeah. people go if they want to find you or y'all's calls and stuff? So then go to phelpsgamecalls.com to buy the calls. Um, that's the metal tube with the easy bugler. We just came out with this new tube. It's the unleashed V2. Uh-huh. It's a plastic tube. It's about the same size as the metal one. Um, you can replace, you can change the heads on it just like your your call there. You can either use diaphragms or you can put the easy bugler on it. Um, oh, cool. Make it easy if you can't use a diaphragm. There's a lot of folks that just can't use a diaphragm or don't want to try to learn um, yeah. And that's that's why we built it that way. But uh, super, super cool tube. Um, but phelpsgamecalls.com, uh, you can find me. And we have, you know, Phelps has an a Instagram channel and YouTube channel. If you want to if you want to watch that hunt. Well, that's I a good info that, on there. Yeah, that New Mexico hunt. It's uh, it's on our YouTube channel right now. And a lot of other New Mexico hunts and um, other hunts in different places. But you can find me on Instagram. It's the Bugler one word um instagram i have a youtube channel as well um got some videos on there and, and a lot of how to use the call so if you go into playlists click playlist and then it says um how to use elk calls click on that playlist and there's five or six videos that will tell you step by step by step from the very first time you put a diaphragm in all the way to the most mm-hmm. in, most advanced calls bugles um so and then on facebook to the bugler one word sweet well, thanks again for your time, man. I feel a little bit better about the situation. I feel like I said, just kind of don't overthink it and just kind of listen and just kind of use common sense. So, but um, really appreciate your time, dude. It's been fun chatting with you. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure, buddy. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.